I got to get on that. You got to get on that. Okay, while Nate's doing that, uh, my name's Dudley. I'm married to Vicki. She's here somewhere. Um, April will be 50 stinking years. I don't look 90, do I? Maybe. Um, we got married when we were younger than you because when you're 18, you know everything, right? And we thought, hey, we're from South Georgia, and that's what people do there. Um, I raised beef cattle for a couple of years, $50 a week. Wasn't getting real rich. Uh, ended up making golf clubs for 10 years for Jack Nicklaus. If some of you know, play golf, know who that is. Uh, did that for 10 years. And then I did youth ministry 25 years. And then the last 25 years, I taught youth ministry at university level. Uh, my PhD is from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and it's in family studies research. Um, so I would teach youth ministry at our university during the day, and then I would go over to the dark side at night and teach family studies, gerontology, family development, uh, child welfare, things like that that I, I learned how to do. Uh, <clears throat> and also still practicing youth ministry. I do uh, a thing called Winterfest. Uh, this was our 38th year of doing that. We had about 6,000 kids in Gatlinburg, Tennessee last month and had about 3,000 in Texas. Uh, so we do a couple of those. I do a National Youth Ministers and Children's Minister Conference that we started about 35 years ago. Uh, still do that. So still involved in doing ministry. And I think when God gets you and you get God, uh, you're, you're on you're in. Uh, there's no, I'll do it part-time or whatever. Uh, it's your, it becomes part of your life. Um, this worked yesterday. It really did. I, I checked it out. So uh, I've, I've got a couple of things in the uh, packet for you. The first page is me get to know you. If you would fill that out sometime today, that would be really cool uh, for me. It'd be helpful. Another thing that I do in every class that starts off, um, and, and I'm asking first name only here, okay? And we'll start right here with Jules. J-U-L-E-S. My daughter-in-law's name Jules. So are you a Juliana? She is too. Hey, see the connection here? Whatever. Uh, here's what this paper says. And you're going to have to think about this, some of you, and some of you will be immediate. Write the first name of a person. Now, when I do this in university, I say this semester, that you want to lead to Christ this semester. And some of you are thinking, I really don't. Yeah. So put your dad's name or somebody. But put a first name. Because then I take those and make a list. Everybody gets a list. We paste it in that Bible that you've got there, the little blue Bible. And we pray for those people every day. Uh, it's never failed during a semester that somebody in the class leads this person to Christ. Um, God made us to make disciples. You're in. That's, that's it. Whether you want to or not, that's why God made us. It's in the Bible. Go and make disciples as you go. Uh, oh, wow, we're on. Stand up. Let's pray together. We've got to do this every time. How many of you know this prayer by heart? You've learned it all your life. If you don't, read it. Our Father, which art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for doing that. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, if you will, put a person's name on there, and, and we'll be doing that this week, praying for that um, deal. Because what I found, people that, that don't do this intentionally, 
and you kind of think, well, I'm a Christian, and I'm supposed to do that, and I want to do ministry and do that. I tell my ministry students, the worst thing's going to happen to you at graduation is you're going to go work for a church. It's going to be the worst thing that happens to you because that day you only hang out with church people. And, and if you do youth ministry, it's a big job. And a lot of times we forget about people that don't know Christ. And so uh, then I do this other bummer thing. So this will be a bummer for some of you. I, I hold up this, or, or, or one of the, these are all Bibles. This is one I'm doing this year. <clears throat> but I hold this up, and think about, I mean, you'll have to think about this a minute. If this is true. And so most of you probably think, well, duh. But think about it. If this is true, if it is true, I was taught there's up or down. I don't know how you guys were taught heaven, hell. But if, if this is true, I mean, if this is true, what else in the world really matters? If this is true. I'll show you a video at some point, maybe, where uh, Penn and Teller, they're atheists. They do shows in Las Vegas, magicians. You've probably seen them on TV. But a guy actually comes up and gives him a Bible. And he's an atheist, does not believe in God. But he says this, this guy was not beating him over the head with it, just said, hey, I went to your show, it was great, put his phone number in it, and said, if you ever got a question, call me. <clears throat> and what Penn says is, if this is true, if you really believed it, how, could, how much do you have to hate your friend or somebody in your family that you wouldn't tell them what was the most important thing in the world, if this is true? Everybody bummed out so far? we got nine more sessions. It's going to be great. <clears throat> so one of the things that I do, I gave you the blue Bible. I'm going to pass some of these around uh, for you to look at. It's just a book. Uh, one of the things that, that we don't do with our Bibles a lot of times, I, I was taught you don't write in it, you don't breathe on it, you know, it's the holy, it is God kind of thing. And, and, and I, I believe that. <laughs> but it's, it's a book of paper. <clears throat> I think God wants us to engage it. As you look at some of these that I'm passing around, this is how people engage and how a, a guy taught me to engage in the Bible. So every year, my wife and I buy a brand new Bible uh, in Christmas. We give it to each other, same Bible. And then we read the whole Bible that year. We write prayers uh, things about it to a certain person. Uh, this year, this is to my second son. We've done all our granddaughters. We've done our siblings. And, and this year, I'm, I'm doing uh, one of my sons and my wife's doing our other son. Uh, but we, we write, when we get to a piece of the text that we don't agree with or it rubs us wrong or it convicts us or whatever, or it's something we totally don't know, Wow. Uh, we write things about it. Uh, I did my sister's, uh, I gave her a Bible last year. She's a believer. Uh, she's not very engaged. Uh, she's very rich and very works a lot. But she uh, texted me the other day when we were in Honolulu Airport. She said, hey, I'm, I'm reading. I finally got to Ezekiel. And she said, I'm reading your crazy stuff you wrote about Ezekiel. If you've read Ezekiel... I, I mean, some of these guys, I think, were smoking pot when they wrote some of this stuff. I mean, it's crazy kind of stuff. And God put it in there for me to read 5,000 years later. Um, so today, uh, in the rest of this time, the next three days, we're going to look at Hosea. And I told Rick over a year ago when uh, he asked me to think about doing this gig that, uh, that I would do something different. And he said, don't do Genesis. He said, like, three people that came last year did Genesis or whatever. I understand you guys just did Leviticus. Was that riveting? No, that was like the second week. Oh, back in October, September, October? Okay. But wasn't Leviticus riveting to you? No. No. So when you read the whole Bible every year, you know you're going to get in tune for what's called harem. We'll talk about that. That's, that's in there. Um, and then all these other things, 
And this year, my wife and I said, we're just doing the New Testament. We're kind of tired of the killing, uh, which is harem. I'll tell you what that is later. Uh, and so I'm, I'm doing the New Testament, and she's doing the New Testament too. But uh, engaging in it, uh, I've given you, uh, my wife and I have taken these blue Bibles to over 100 countries, and they're on all seven continents. Uh, if you go to Antarctica and go to the Port Lockery Post Office, which is the only thing tourists can go to, basically, uh, there's, there's these Winterfest Bibles are in that post office, and they're on the ships, too, that we were on. Uh, I usually give them to people. You do not want to sit by me on an airplane because uh, you will know about Jesus before you get off the airplane. And I, I met Lauren flying over here Thursday, and we started talking. Ends up, her parents went to Wheaton uh, College or what's it called now, whatever, Wheaton University. And we started talking about, and she, you know what, I was actually writing a note to my son in that Bible, and, and it, we just started talking about Christ. And so uh, you can do those kind of things. You don't have to beat people over the head with it or whatever, but uh, people want to know uh, about the Lord. So if you do have a Bible, an Old Testament, we will be uh, in the book of Hosea. And it's right after Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, those what's called the major prophets. If you've got the real Bible, it's on page 1195. I'm actually going to read from the message because it, it makes a little more maybe clearer. Um, let me say this. I, I know you guys have phones and you're, you're into it. Uh, in my classes at university, if you had your phone out, it was minus 10. I'm not going to do that here. But if you see me look at you and I freeze for a minute, I'm thinking I should count off 10. Uh, but also I know some of you have your Bible on your phone too, so that's, that's kind of cool too. Well, let me get into this. I also have my phone set for 945. It's going to go off, and that, that means we have a break. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see if we can do this. So that you'll know me a little bit, and, and I'm probably going to offend you, some of you maybe, by some things I say that I hope come out of Scripture. I don't know about you, but I'm offended a lot when I read the text because it tells me to do something that I don't want to do. <clears throat> if I tore out every page as I grew up reading the Bible that had things on it I went, didn't want to do, it, I wouldn't have a Bible because I, I grew up crazy. Um, so here's where I'm coming from, L1, L2. Uh, somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Uh, second, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. Not narcissistically, but I am probably the greatest person I've ever met in my life. And I've met a lot of famous people, but I have that maybe overconfidence sometimes or whatever, but God made me. Uh, he made me like I am. Uh, he made me be able to change. Uh, he made me be able to like most people, um, to love everybody. And um, the L1, L2 greatest, I mean, that's where you come from. I think the four most important words in the Bible, if you'll turn over to Genesis 1-1, everybody turn there real quick. It's in the front of your Bible. It's the first book. Four most important words in the Bible. In the beginning, God. And I fall back on that a lot because a lot of things happen. Uh, it, one of our sons had cancer. It was a bummer. I, I was had been in ministry and teaching, and I, I really did that, lay on the floor all night long and cry and pray to God, why me? God, you... I, you made me, and I help all these people. I do all these great things for you, and now our son has cancer. Uh, and I was telling Dane or somebody back there, it, it was a rough two years uh, praying for our son to be alive and to stay alive. Uh, he's been free 15 years. Uh, he's married, plays drums in Life Church, and he's 
He's a great kid. Um, but in the beginning, God. And so a lot of times I have to just come back to that when things are not good or whatever. In the beginning, God. He's got this. He's got you. Uh, a lot of times, even when you don't, the song you're singing about remember us, God, he, oh, he, he knows you. He doesn't have to remember you. He knows you. He's pursuing you. As we look at Hosea, you're going to see things about God in here that you don't see in any other book in the Bible. We, we really see a side of God that you kind of go, wow, he's getting a little wussy on us here about these people that don't like him or forget him or whatever. In the beginning, God. And then another passage of scripture that I have to fault on sometimes because sometimes when God tells you to do things and you kind of go, God, I, I don't know, man, I'm tired, I don't want to do this, I hate her, I hate him, I don't like this, uh, blah, blah, blah. Luke 5, verse 5. And Jesus is telling these guys to do I think this is about the fish. Throw your net on the other side or somewhere. But there's a line there that says, okay, but because you said so, I'll do this. And so Jesus said the next line there, as you go, make disciples. So when you leave here for the weekend or what, whenever your free days are, as you go surfing, or watching dolphins or whatever you do here, those kind of things. As you go, you make disciples. God's going to put people in your pathway. And sometimes I go, I don't want to talk to that person about it. It just didn't seem right. I don't know where Jesus is going to fit in here. But because you said so, I'm going to look for an intentional opportunity to share my faith. Because Jesus said so. So... That's another thing that we live our life by. And then the as you go, uh, Mark 16, Matthew 28, as you go, make disciples. And then probably the thing that um, comes from Romans 8, the greatest chapter in the Bible, Romans 8. Uh, nothing, you guys need to know this, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Think of the stupidest thing you've done so far. You're not through doing stupid things. That can't separate you from the love of God. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, if you go on Spotify, look up O oh Chansey. That's my son's bands. They got a couple. Uh, but one of my boys wrote a Romans 8 album. And uh, I'm, I think I have one they did in concert. I'll, I'll play that sometime this week. But uh, one of the songs is Nothing Can Separate Us in uh, and I'm so glad for that because I'm I'm 70 something and I still uh, do stupid. Uh, I I try not to do it intentionally, uh, but I also know that nothing can separate me from the love of God. So that's where I'm coming from this week. Little history here. You've got some handouts in your deal there that I'll refer to uh, during this next uh, few sessions here. TNK, when you see that, that's the northern kingdom. Hosea, only prophet sent to the northern kingdom specifically. And this was a bad place. Now you'll hear the ten tribes, that's the northern kingdom. You'll hear Samaria sometimes, even in Hosea, that's the, the northern kingdom. You'll hear Ephraim, it's the northern kingdom. Um, what's amazing about this that you'll see as we go through this whole thing is that they are so messed up eventually in 722 B.C., they're wiped off the face. We never, ever hear from them again. They're gone. They're gone. Now, there's still Benjamin and Judah down south. They last a few more years, but in 586, you know, they go off to Babylon. What I want you to think about this week uh, is what in the heck does Hosea have to say for us? It's 2024, uh, however many thousand years ago that uh, somebody wrote down the things that Hosea said. There's a little bit of history. Hosea didn't sit down and write this book. Uh, somebody put it together. There's actually some parts in here that scholars think. Somebody from Judah, the south, threw in a couple of things about Judah. Um, and you'll see those as we read along. It's a very difficult book uh, for scholars to try to lay it out in a nice, easy outline and say, hey, th this is what he meant. This is what it's about. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along.
So why do we study this book? If you read uh, 2 Timothy, uh, what is it, 3, uh, 15. From infancy you've known the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scriptures God breathed. It's used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness so that we, servants of God, might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So there's, there's something in scripture. When Paul wrote this to Timothy, he did not have the New Testament what you guys have, what we have. He didn't have that. He had the scriptures, which is the Old Testament. And that's what they had. So he's saying, this stuff is good for these four things. Teaching, rebuking, correcting. If you need it in plainer, scripture shows us the truth. It exposes our rebellion. I'm convicted every stinking day I read this kind of because it always hits on something that I can improve on in my life. Um, it's amazing. Correcting our mistakes and train us, training us to live God's way. So when you read scripture uh, and it says, hey, you ought to do this or that, you, you probably ought to do this or that. Okay. Uh, Jesus quotes or alludes to the Old Testament 180 times. His book, if anybody ever asked you Trivial Pursuit, his book was what? Starts with a D. It's in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy. Are there any other books that start with a D? Daniel. Okay, it wasn't Daniel. Uh, especially the last part of Daniel. <clears throat> now, when we study, um, typically in any class you guys take in university or in high school, anywhere, we tend to think everybody's like us because we're the greatest ever nation in the whole world. We are... God's chosen nation. Everybody thinks it's Israel. It's the United States, right? Um, but we tend to think everybody's like me. It's called ethnocentrism. And so we tend to do this to people uh, when we want to make them like us. And this happened, of course. Um, we made these people. I moved to Oklahoma. Uh, I already had this kind of inquisitive thing about Indians, Native Americans, and my wife and I, my wife's part Cherokee back in her lineage, and so we thought, hey, we're going to move to Oklahoma, and, and that's where all the Indians in the world are now, because we moved them all out there in this desolate, stinking flat land before they knew it had oil. How many have seen the flower, Killers of the Flower Moon? Have you guys seen it? it it's terrible, but it's true, but anyway. Uh, we did that to people, and I thought we'd learn a lot about Indians, and Indians would be all over the place, you know, and all, but it's, it's crazy. I uh, asked some of my students from Tulsa, Oklahoma, when I first moved there, I said, tell me about the riots in Tulsa, and they're like, there were no riots in Tulsa. Uh, actually, there were. They burnt down half the city where the black people lived uh, in Tulsa. They just two years ago made it mandatory to put that in the history book of Oklahoma history. It was not even in the history book uh, kind of thing. This is the craziest picture I could find of uh, Hawaiians back in the day. Uh, but when the missionaries came over, uh, they dressed them in white people's clothes. And they, they basically, you, you can't help not to teach some of your own culture of who you are and if I open up the Bible and start teaching you if I'm not careful I'll teach you how the Bible is from the south I'm from the south uh, I just got a copy of the First Nations Bible it's the New Testament it's been translated by uh, Hebrew Greek scholars uh, Aramaic scholars with First Nations people and so when you read the word Jesus in that Bible, it's translated creator that saves. That's Jesus. Uh, if they get in Noah built the ark, it's uh, over in 1 Peter when it says Noah and was saved and eight people. It's a canoe. you know. And so things are changed. The colonization that's uh, been translated into our Bibles is they try to take it out or whatever. But uh, we have a tendency... And even translators that translated the Bible had a tendency to, to make it fit them uh, kind of deal. 
And there's, there's several examples about that. Here's an example of that, and you've seen some of these. One of my uh, chores for students or their task is to get me the craziest picture they can get of ethnocentric Jesus. And so you've probably seen some of these. Um, and one of my Old Testament professors would say, you know, why does Jesus always look like he's got blue eyes and light skin or whatever? It's because blue-eyed, light-skinned people painted him. Uh, European artists painted all of those pictures. Uh, very famous picture, Jesus knocking at the door. Uh, I mean, this is as North American as you can get. Here's a Catholic picture. Uh, this is a pretty good, Jesus praying. Uh, some of these are from the movies, and so you've seen some of these movies. Uh, Jesus with children, white children. Uh, this is fair. This is a post office picture of Jesus, black and white uh, kind of deal. I'll do these quick because there's like 3,000 of them. Uh, Got to have a lamb. I love this. Uh, that's my Jesus right there. Any Red Sox fans here? Braves? Baseball? Couple? Okay. Been to all the stadiums in the United States, been to all the ones in Caribbean, Central America. I've done all the ones in Japan, but two. And it's it's a trip. I love love baseball. Can't wait till spring training's over and it starts back. Um, but some people would think this is Jesus, you know, and maybe if you're football, he's helping you throw a pass or or something. My one of my favorite Jesus is the passion, Jim Caviezel. JC, 33 years old when he made the movie, just saying. <laughs> Who knew Christian Bale would be Jesus? I mean, come on. This is probably one of the most famous Jesuses that ever was. The film the, uh, from the book of Luke has been translated into over 78 languages, been shown all over the world. Uh, literally millions of people have seen that and, and been led to Christ from that movie. Um, another famous Jesus from the movies. Another white Jesus. This was the first Jesus movie I can find. I've got like 50 movies that have been made about Jesus. And this was actually a, a not a talky movie, so it had words at the bottom. Once again, Jesus with some white children there. This is Bruce Marciano. Uh, he did the Matthew film, and uh, he came to our youth conferences a couple of times just talking to our kids about going through the process, especially they wanted to know if you've ever watched this film, the crucifixion thing. It took him like three days to do that. It, said it just physically wore him out, getting beat, and then thrown on this piece of wood and, and getting nails driven, which obviously didn't drive nails in, but it looks like they do. Um, and him going through that. But the premise of this film was all films before this about Jesus had been the sorrowful Jesus or whatever. The producers of this film wanted to portray Jesus as the joyful Jesus. And so you'll see him smiling a lot in that film because it's like, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Now this week after we finish Hosea, you're going to go out and beat yourself. Uh, but we'll try to help you with that. Uh, one year in our golf club plant, I was on second shift and I had about 30 people working for me and I walked by one of our sandblast machines and there was a picture that had been taped to it of a black Jesus. Now, we're in South Georgia and there, there's still a thing about the N-word. Uh, my sister's a Nazi Church of Christ lady and she still uses the N-word and I, I just get up and walk out when she does. I just, I, I can't take it we get our children and get up and walk out and she tries to apologize and I say no it's, it's in your heart what's in your heart comes out of your mouth and uh, she's she's getting better but wow um, so you may not picture Jesus looking like this um, that that totally would be against especially if you're from the south they would burn this 
and, and they would make me burn this computer because they don't understand computers yet either down there. I, when I got this picture from a student, I, I was like, you, you're kidding, you know? I mean, this is Jeezbo or Rambo or somebody, you know? And I thought, man, this is crazy. Uh, here's what you want Jesus to teach your kids. I mean, hey, let's go out and shoot the nine mils, you know? Uh, these, are, these are from South Georgia people, sorry. Now, check out this next picture. Look at this one really good. <laughs> I mean, Photoshop's amazing, right? Don't believe anything you guys see on your phones. Don't, don't believe it. This may be one of the most famous Jesus paintings. Uh, my mom had this in our house, and we weren't Catholic or anything. It just, I think a door-to-door -door salesman was selling pictures of Jesus and Bibles one day, and she bought one. Notice how darker this Jesus is. It's the same picture, just darker. Got to have Legos, right? Lego Jesus. Probably the most famous current Jesus right now, uh, Jonathan uh, Romine. Is that how you say his last name? Romine? Rumi? Jonathan Rumi. And now we get into, uh, these were uh, our basketball players in my class, and some of our soccer players brought some of these in. And I thought, Who, who's going to nail this guy to the cross? I mean, wow. Uh, it's in Hebrew, I think, I, so I don't know. It probably says tattoo this. Um, I read in your manual you're not supposed to get tattoos while you're here because your parents might get upset or something. We always told our boys, as long as they lived in the house, no tattoos, no piercings. And when my son uh, got cancer his senior year of high school, uh, we never had cable. It's a waste of money. And once again, I, I really bought into this thing about people are dying and going to hell and we're... We're watching cable. Uh, we can give that money and buy Bibles. Uh, but the day I found out he had cancer, he loved sports, I called Cox and I said, get over here and put cable in right now. And so he had cable for about a year. Uh, once we found out, he was the doctor said, dude, I don't want to ever see you again. I called Cox and said, come get that out of our, get that out of our house. Uh, but uh, about six months into his treatments, he came in one day and uh, he had an earring, and he said, Dad, I got three tattoos today. And I'm like, I mean, what do you tell your son? He's a senior in high school, so he still lives there, but he's just broke two of your major kind of rules. And I said, where are you going to live? You know? And it was a clip-on earring, so he took that off. Psych. And his three tattoos were lined up for radiation. They put three dots on you, and they're permanent forever. I mean, you'd have to almost get a microscope now to see them. Uh, it kept him out of the Army. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to go to the Army if you've been cancer, tattooed, or whatever. Anyway, uh, another, I just, I can't imagine nailing this guy to anything. I would see him nailing me is what I would see. Now, I do want to say this. I don't think Jesus was a wuss, okay, so make sure you hear that. I don't think he was this little scrawny dude walking around, although uh, in the end here, you may change your mind about that. Once again, a little African-American-ish here is great. I mean, this would make Arnold Schwarzenegger look like a, what a, I mean, look, wow. Now we get to the nationalism kind of stuff, and these, these came from my southern students also. They were, because they're the ones riding around with rebel flags and all this kind of stuff. But 
this was this was uh, during when Trump the first time was running for office. John Wayne, uh, what's his name? Trump. What's his name? Crap. What's his first name? Donald. Donald, Donald Duck. Donald Trump. And Jesus. Uh, but if you're not careful, I mean, I love the United States. Uh, my wife and I, when we go in the summers to do missions and Bibles, and we're gone almost all summer, and, and I come back, I, I'll kiss the dirt of the tarmac. I mean, this, this is the greatest Babylon in the world, as Tony Campolo would say. I hope you can think about what that means. Way to go, Jesus, here. Yeah. Vander Holyfield, a great boxer, was on Johnny Carson, and Johnny asked him, he was talking about his trainers and people like that, and he said, well, who, who do you find you can trust? And he says this, he said, Johnny, I trust God, everybody else is suspect. A flag and a gun, you can't beat that one. Throw a cross in there. And then this is, I mean... Think about what, I mean, this is so, oh. And if that one fails, put Jesus with George Washington. You can't mess up with that, you know. This most likely could be as close to Jesus, uh, a guy, artist, from reading uh, Isaiah and some other things, kind of put this together. But I, I would ask you to think about what your Jesus looks like a lot of times we try to make him fit us, but read Isaiah 53. I mean, it sounds like, wow, he's pretty ugly. I mean, when it says no, nobody wanted to look at him, I'm thinking, wow, yikes. Uh, they sure wanted to he him to heal him, though, and so anyway. All right. So be careful uh, when you're reading the Bible uh, how to do that. A lot of times we read the Old Testament and we think, well, we're not in it. It wasn't written for us. I remember when we hired a new Old Testament professor where I was teaching, we got an email from a Bible banger guy in the South, and he said, uh, I can't believe y'all wasted money teaching the Old Testament because the New Testament is all we need today. Um, all Scripture, just keep that in mind, and in the beginning, God. Uh, so we can learn something from everything. So a little history here, uh, Hosea, Amos, Micah, and Isaiah, those are, they were contemporaries. Uh, Hosea is the only one that overlapped all three of those. Amos overlapped a couple of them. Uh, he's in the north of Israel. If you look at your maps uh, there, there's north Israel and south Israel. Uh, I've got some of those here later. Uh, Hosea walked around for 40 years stinking years. I mean, think about that. How, who's the oldest besides me and dad? But your oldest? How old are you? 23. 23. Wow. Just think, 23 years, 17 more years trying to tell these people about Jesus, and none of them are listening to you. And every day you go to the synagogue or you go out in the square and you're telling them about Jesus, and they're, they're not listening. I mean, 40 years he did that. Right up uh, most likely, Hosea and his family could have been carted off uh, by the Assyrians in 722 because we, we never hear from them again as an entity. Uh, you may hear Hosea called the Book of the Twelve or the Scroll of the Twelve. There's 12 minor prophets, and they're not minor because they don't matter as much as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're minor because they're small. They're easy to read. You're reading the Bible through. If you, if you get through Leviticus and Numbers reading the whole Bible, you kind of go, okay, we're going to coast. And then you hit Isaiah, 66 chapters of him trying to tell Israel, dude, get your act together. He's talking to Judah and Benjamin, basically, down south. And then you hit Jeremiah, and he's the kind of loomy-doomy prophet also. Uh, they're always throwing him in a well or trying to get rid of him or kill him. He's complaining to God the whole time. And you think, okay, we got through that. And then you hit Ezekiel. And this dude is wheels and wheels and bones, dry bones and all. And you're kind of going, what? What is going on here? Um, and then you hit the 12 little books and you kind of go, oh, this is a breather, man. Jonah's easy. Uh, Hosea, eh. 
you know, a mica is really good, and then you hit those two or three pages, and then you hit that two sheets in the middle of your Bible that says the inner testament or whatever, and then you hit Matthew, and the first thing you hit in Matthew is a genealogy, and you can't say half of those names. So it's really cool. And you got to wonder, God, why would you start a book off with 5,000 names that nobody can say? Uh, well, it was written for Jewish people, and, and those people, heritage matters. If I can tell you where I came from, it matters. Your name matters. Um, Hosea worked in a time of po uh, bad political leadership. We're going to do one whole session about leadership. Um, it, it was terrible. We'll talk about that. Uh, but what was worse about this is concerns you guys. Uh, I'm assuming, I, I probably shouldn't assume because I don't, I don't know. Where's Cruz? He wasn't sick the whole weekend and he got sick today. Wow. All right, he's staying after school. Uh, anyway, I, I was talking to him uh, the other day when we first got here, um, but I'll save that when he's here. Okay, what's in the name? What I want you to do right now on some piece of paper, that get to know you paper down at the bottom of it, write your name and then write, tell me where it comes from, uh, who you're named after, what your name means, anything you know about your name. Ready? You got one minute. Ready, set, go. Should be grabbing your pencil. That's that long thing. Those pencils, by the way, are, are direct from Mother Teresa before she died. We got two or three boxes from, and if you read the pencil, it says, I'm a pencil in God's hand. It's pretty cool. You are a pencil in God's hand. Okay, you're, you're telling me about your name. Oh my goodness, we're not even started here. It's going to be great. What's your name? Uh, Maria. Maria. It's a good Bible name. Yeah, as a good reader, what I got was that my name is an offshoot of my family name. Where's your family background from? Um, I'm half Cuban, half Cuba. Oh, I've been to Cuba. It's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. I got a post yesterday from my buddy that drives us in Cuba. In Havana? Um, no, I, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So one of my heroes that drives people crazy is El Che. He's just, a, I mean, because of not the bad stuff, but just stepping out. And we went to his house. Really? Yeah. Okay, quickly, starting on the back row back there, uh, tell us your name and if your name from somebody or your parents just went, yeah, that's... Yeah. What's your name? Nolan. Nolan. Ryan. Nolan Ryan. Let's go with that. Great picture. Seven shutouts. All right, over here. Grace, that, that's probably a good. All right. Okay. Yeah, you're the good guys. Say it again. Uh, Ryan. Ryan. No, no. Cool. 
Okay. So two Olivias? <laughs> Is she? Okay, just checking. Cool. So uh, my name's Dudley, and my uh, dad and his parents were white sharecroppers, which is a white slave in the South. And they had 13 or 14 children and about four or five miscarriages and stillbirths along the way. My dad was born, literally my grandmother was hoeing tobacco in the field. Her water broke. They took her to the end of the row. My aunt ran and got towels and water and stuff, and he was born at the end of a tobacco row. They had gotten a guy that was sort of a doctor. I don't know what that means. Uh, but he literally pulls him out and says, hey, it's a boy. What are you going to name him? And my aunt's telling me this story. He said, my grandmother's pretty tough. I mean, you got to be tough. Oh, and tobacco, nine months pregnant. And whatever. Um, said, well, we're out of names. We, we got seven boys. We're out of, and said, what's your name? And the doctor said, my name's Dudley Hendry. And he said, that's his name. So there's, there's where I come from uh, for a name. But what, what you're going to see in uh, the first three chapters of Hosea's names are important. Um, I don't know about you, and I know it's past your deal, but you've probably seen it on MeTV, Gomer Pyle. USMC, uh, Hosea marries a woman named Gomer, and it's hard. When I get to that, I immediately think of Gomer Pyle, Jim Neighbors, who actually ended up living and dying in Hawaii, uh, and so I have, I have to kind of get that behind me, that Gomer Pyle, uh, because then when you read on, you find out, wow, not only does she have a weird name, but she has a weird profession or ends up doing some crazy things. But then the three children have names that mean something. Usually everybody's name in the Bible, when you read a name in the Bible, it means something. Uh, so don't, don't take your name lightly. Um, appreciate your name. If you don't like it, I guess when you get 18 you can change it or whatever. But uh, your name probably meant something to your parents. You, you should go ask them. I'll, I'll ask you this because I always do this. Uh, how many of you, we got one minute. How many of you are, well, we don't. All right, we'll, we'll continue after this. Take a break. Be back at 10 sharp. <laughs>